जय राध माधवा कुंज भी हारी जय राध माधवा कुंज बिहारी गोपी जान बाला गिरी पर गोपी जान बाला भा गिरी पर यशोद नंदन ब्रज जन रंजन यशोद नंदन ब्रज जन रंजन या मुन तेरा चारी मुन थेरा वन चारी हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे नित्य गोर हरि बो हरि बो हरि बो नित्य गोर हरि बो जय जय प्रभु पाद प्रभु पाद प्रभु पाद जय जय प्रभु पाद और प्रेमानंदे हरि बो नम ओम विष्णु पदाय कृष्ण पृष्ठाय भूतले श्रीमती भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नित्य नाम 
नाम से सरस्वती देवे खोरवाणी प्रसारी में निर्विशेष शून्य बाधी ओम नमो भगवते वसुदेवा ओम नमो भगवते वसुदेवा नमो भागवते वसुदेवा so we are recounting the pastimes of narada muni narada muni searching for the recipient of the greatest mercy from lord krishna and we heard how he had come to lord brahma thinking that lord brahma had received the greatest mercy from lord krishna but lord brahma directs him to lord shiva he said actually he said lord shiva is much more qualified than i am lord shiva is very very great personality you go to him he really got the mercy of the supreme lord if you go you you can see for yourself when you go there and uh, we heard yesterday lord brahma was telling narada that don't don't go to the kailash in this universe that's where kuvera is but you can go out of the universe go into kailash beyond the universe where the lord lord shiva is residing in his greatest opulence so narada muni hears all of this from his father lord brahma and narada muni is ready to go off and find out go and see lord shiva for himself so uh lord shiva went to went to shiva loka went to kailash and when he came into kailash then he saw uh, when he's going he's chanting he was chanting vishnu shiva vishnu shiva he was chanting the names of the lord like this because one of the instructions was that the name of lord shiva is equal to the not so different from the name of lord vishnu so he was chanting like that of course he was chanting in the mood of devotion he wasn't chanting in the mood that uh shiva is uh that lord shiva is the impersonal brahman and vishnu is the impersonal brahman and they're all one in that sense but he understood the eternal nature of the lord that lord shiva was the expansion he's the incarnation of lord vishnu they're both guna avatars right we have of course three guna avatars lord brahma is also guna avatar so they're they're guna avatars and it's lord vishnu who is uh, the original of well, lord vishnu of course he is the expansion coming from lord krishna lord krishna is the original personality and vishnu is the expansion from krishna and shiva is an expansion from vishnu mm. so they're one but at the same time they're different so narada muni went to kailash and when he gets to kailash he sees lord shiva's doing kirtan 
Lord Shiva, oh no, first Lord Shiva was doing his puja. He was worshipping Lord Sankar, Sankarshan. This is uh, important to understand Lord Shiva worshipping his deity. This is puja. Lord Shiva was worshipping Lord Sankarshan and uh, he just finished his puja. He was worshipping just like we heard in the very beginning, the Brahmana at Prayag, how he was worshipping his shalagram. So the Brahmana was very, very carefully doing his puja for the shalagram shila. And the same way, Lord Shiva, he's also doing his puja. And he's worship, he was worshipping Lord Sankarshan. We should understand that Lord Shiva does puja. It's not like we do puja. We do puja for our purification. Now, Lord Shiva, he's already pure. He doesn't need purification. So why is he doing puja? Lord Shiva was doing puja. One reason is to show example for all of us. And to also, there's different levels of devotees who do puja. Now, some people, we are more like neophytes. And we do it to purify ourselves and to elevate ourselves. And some people do puja, they're very advanced devotees. And when they do puja, they actually feel the presence of the Lord. They're not just thinking, oh, I'm doing this puja, I'm doing this, and we do it like a ritual. But they actually understand the presence of the Lord is there in their deity. And so, Feeling the presence of the Lord, the devotees will feel ecstasy in the course of their worship of the Lord. And this is true with Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva was worshipping his deity and he was feeling so much bliss, so much ecstasy from associating and serving the Lord. And so Narada Muni came there and he saw Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva had just finished doing the puja and then he began kirtan. And his, or just a few people, Lord Shiva was there with his wife, Gauri, and different associates like Nandeshwara and like that. So Lord Shiva was singing and dancing in ecstasy and Gauri, his wife, she was clapping her hands and she was clapping her hands very nicely to enliven Lord Shiva in his dancing. So Lord Shiva was appreciating how his wife was contributing to the kirtan by her hand clapping. So Narada Muni came there and he saw all the devotees, how they were having kirtan and they were in bliss. Narada Muni begins to chant the glories of Lord Shiva as he had heard from Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma had already told him a lot of the glories of Lord Shiva. And Narada is chanting. You are the greatest devotee of the Lord. You've got the greatest mercy from the Lord. And Narada is chanting in this way. And he comes before Lord Shiva. And at one point, he wants to offer his obeisances to Lord Shiva. In the dust at the feet of Lord Shiva. But somehow he came forward. He came forward and he embraced. Lord Shiva. But at the same time, he's chanting the glories of Lord Shiva. The 
you are so fortunate. You've got the mercy of the Lord. You are the greatest devotee. And Lord Shiva was thinking, what is this? What's going on? What's he talking about? And then he began to say how, he told how, uh, he said, uh, you, you give blessings to the Lord. You're so fortunate. You have such a great position that you can give blessings to the Lord. And when Lord Shiva heard this, he became a little angry and he put his hand over the mouth of Narada and said, don't talk like this. What are you saying? Actually, Lord Shiva had given blessings to Lord Krishna at one point. At one point, he blessed Lord Krishna that he would have a good son. And from that blessing, Samba was born. Samba is the son of, born in the womb, from the womb of Jambavati. So that was one of the blessings which Lord Shiva had given to Lord Krishna. But Lord Shiva doesn't like to be reminded of that. He thinks that was my arrogance that I am, how, who am I to give blessings to the Lord, to the Supreme Lord? I have no qualification to give him blessing. So Narada becomes a little careful about what he's saying about Lord Shiva. And he began to tell some of the different things which Lord Shiva had done. He wants to remind Lord Shiva just how he did get really the mercy of the Lord. And he, one of the things was he, he talks about uh, how different demons, different, the en some enemies of Krishna, how they worship Lord Shiva to get benedictions. So there's a few examples of this, how the, sometimes these enemies would come and worship Lord Shiva. One of the enemies was this Jayadrata. Jayadrat. He, Jayadrat had become very much infatuated by Draupadi. He really wanted Draupadi. And he took part in the, the contest, the archery contest. But he, he didn't succeed, of course. He wasn't such a great archer that he could pierce the eye of the fish, as was done by Arjuna. But he didn't give up the desire to get Draupadi. And so it happened that one time when the Pandavas along with Draupadi were in exile and they were at a place called Kamyavan. So at that time, Jayadrata saw Draupadi. And uh, he, his lust for her was awakened. And so he sent a message to her, inviting her to come and meet him and spend time with him because he thought, you know, she's in exile, living in the forest. It must be really difficult for her as a princess, such a woman. We have to understand how Draupadi was such a, an, an, a very special lady. She was born, of course, at the same time as Drista Jumna from the fire, from the Yagya of Maharaj Drupada. And it said that just the aroma of her body was so attractive that people would just be, they'd just become bewildered. 
the aroma, the fragrance and scent coming from her body was just so powerful that the minds of all the men would become bewildered and they would all become infatuated by her. She was actually like a demigoddess or something because she, she was just so beautiful and so overwhelming. So Jayadrata was just crazy about her. So he sent this letter to her telling her, come and spend some time with me and I will satisfy you. I will take care of you. And, and she was very angry. Of course, she had nothing to do with him. She didn't want anything to do with Jayadrata. She'd already got five Pandavas for husbands. Why would she want Jayadrata? You know, and her husbands were such wonderful, powerful men as well. You know, Maharatis. And they were also born from the demigods. So they were also very, very powerful, very handsome and very intelligent, had all the good qualities. So Jayadrata, you know, how could he, you know, how could he hope to attract Draupadi? But still, the lust is so strong. He, and because he was a prince, he had some opulence, he had his army and so on. He thought, you know, she should come and be with me. So anyway, she didn't want anything to do with them. But then he saw her again one time and he happened to see her on her own. So he tried to pick her up and put, him up, put her on his chariot. And she just knocked him over and she hit him and he fell over. But he picked himself up and he came back and somehow he was able to get her and put her on his chariot. And he was going off with her. But then Domya, one of the sages, he had seen this and he had told Jayadrata, this is terrible. You can't do this. She's a married woman. You can't take her like this. This is very bad. This is not Dharma. And he went and he told the Pandavas. So when the Pandavas heard that Jayadrata had done this, then they came after Jayadrata. And Bhima, he really beat Jayadrata. He really beat him to a pub, practically killed him. And they tied him up and bound him like a prisoner. And then they brought him to all the different kings. And they, they said, tell everyone, you are the slave of Maharaj Yudhisthira. So Jayadrata, he'd been a king. He was a king, a prince and royal with an army, and he was being humiliated like this. He was taken before many different people, and he had to tell everyone that he was the servant of Maharaj Yudhisthira. However, when Maharaj Yudhisthira came there and saw, and when Draupadi came, even Draupadi said, this is not good. Don't do that to him. Release him. Let him go. So they let Jayadrata go, but he was very angry and he wanted to get revenge. So he went to the Himalayas and he did great tapasya and he worshipped Lord Shiva. <laughs> right? So Lord Shiva, he, is, he gives he give the blessing, but he gives it when his people like Jayadrata, he will give the blessing in such a way that there'll be some kind of loophole, you know, some, you know, the other effect will be produced, you know. So he gave the blessing to Jayadrata. The blessing was, he wanted the blessing that he would be able at least one time to hold off the Pandavas in battle, that he'd be able to hold them off, to defeat them. He couldn't get the blessing that he could kill them, but he could get the blessing that he could hold them off. He could frustrate them. And so it happened that in the course of the battle of Kurukshetra, that was, it was at the time Abhimanu 
had gone, he, the, well, the Kurava army had made the formation of a wheel and nobody could enter that wheel. But Abhimanu, he knew how to enter the wheel, the chakra formation. And Abhimanu went into that chakra, he's fighting, but he got tackled by seven great Maharatis. We told yesterday there were six Maharatis fighting against, who was that yesterday? Uh, oh, Anirudh. Anirudh, when he was arrested by Bana, there were six Maharatis after him. Or maybe it was Luck. Huh? Samba. Samba. Yes, yeah, Samba and Lakshmana, right? Samba. Samba. They, when he kidnapped Lakshmana, the daughter of Duryodhana, at that time, six Maharatis came and fought with Samba. And they didn't kill him, but they took him a prisoner. But at the Battle of Kurukshetra, seven Maharatis all got onto Jayadrata and they killed the, the Abhimanu. They got onto Abhimanu and they killed Abhimanu. And the reason why they were all able to fight uh, Abhimanu was because Jayadrata had held off the Pandavas. Jayadrata had that benediction from Lord Shiva that he could hold off the Pandavas at least one time. So he held off the Pandavas in battle. And at that time, they had killed Abhimanu. So of course, when Abhimanu was killed, Abhimanu is the son of Arjuna and Subhadra. So Arjuna is really angry. So he makes a vow, tomorrow I'm going to kill Jayadrata. <laughs> and of course, the next day, they went to battle and it was a bit tricky. Lord Krishna helped with a little trickery. They thought the sun had set, but then the sun didn't set. <laughs> and that time, Krishna, Arjuna killed Jayadrata. Anyway, Jayadrata, he got that blessing from Lord Shiva that he could hold off the Pandavas, but he couldn't hold off Arjuna. And it was Arjuna who killed him. But it, Lord Krishna told Arjuna, he said, you have to be careful that there's a curse that if anybody knocks the head of Jayadrata to the ground, their head will also crack open. So when Arjuna cut off the head of Jayadrata, he threw the head into the lap of his father. Jayadrata's father had somehow, he'd arranged this curse that if anybody knocks down the head of my son, their head will crack open. So the Arjuna cut off the head of Jayadrata and threw it into the lap of the father of Jayadrata. Jayadrata's father was sitting, meditating, and all of a sudden this head fell into his lap. And he, he didn't see it was his son's head, and he just knocked it off. And when he knocked off the head, immediately his head, his head exploded. And so, so many things. You can see Lord Krishna helping, and Lord Shiva also helping. <laughs> Lord Shiva also. So this was one, one example. Another example was uh, Garga. That Garga also was, he was, he was at odds with the, the, with the Yadavas and the Pandavas. Garga Acharya. And he, he wanted, he wanted a benediction that he could kill the, he wanted a benediction that he could kill, who was it? Anyway, he wanted some benediction to defeat, the, to defeat, get a son who could kill. Uh, what is that? I have to check that. I can't remember. Hmm? But Garga.
Yeah, Garga. Uh, Garga was inimical with the Yadavas and the Pandavas. The, they were all staunch Vaishnavas. The Lord Shiva rewarded the worship of Garga with an imperfect boon. And Gar Gargia, Gargia Balaki was a learned son of the sage Garga, who was too proud of his acquired knowledge. By Lord Shiva's blessing, Gargia obtained a son, but not one who could destroy the Yadu dynasty as Garga had wanted, only one who could frighten and frustrate the Yadu dynasty. <laughs> so this Garga wanted a son who could defeat the, but he, he, he wasn't able to defeat them, but he was able to frighten and frustrate the Yadu dynasty. So this is another example of Lord Shiva, how he gives these kind of blessings to the enemies of the devotees. Because they worship him, so he has to give some kind of blessing. But he gives the blessing in such a way to protect his devotees. Mm. And then an another example is there. Uh, We have the example of Chitraketu. How Maharaj Chitraketu, he laughed at Lord Shiva. And because he laughed at Lord Shiva, Lord Shiva's wife cursed him. Now, Lord Shiva and Chitraketu were actually friends. They had some friendship there because they were both devotees of. Uh, Sankarshan or Shesha, who is the expansion coming from Lord Balaram. So when Chitraketu saw Lord Shiva sitting with his wife, Lord Shiva sitting with his wife on his lap and with his arm around her in front of an assembly of great sages. So Chitraketu Maharaj came there and saw this situation and seeing Lord Shiva in this situation, he was smiling and laughing and thinking it's funny that Lord Shiva is there with his wife in front of so many great sages. And Chitraketu is laughing, but Lord Shiva's wife, she's angry and she got upset and she cursed him that he should become a demon. But it said that, so at that particular time, Chitraketu's uh, devotion was not fully perfect. He, has, he was not yet a pure Vaishnava, 100% pure Vaishnava. So that was maybe one reason why he had laughed at Lord Shiva. But by the curse, it was actually a blessing for Chitraketu because when he became Vrita, then he got rid of all of his karma. He got rid of all of his karma from any path and he was able to go back to Godhead. It, was a help, it actually helped him to accelerate his path back to the spiritual world to be with his worshipable deity who was Anantashesha or Sankarshan. So that cursing of Parvati was a, worked out as a blessing for Chitraketu. Now, Narada Muni, he glorifies Lord Shiva. He's telling Lord Shiva that you're even, Lord Krishna, 
has so much love for you that he allows you to be even greater than he is. And so the, there's an example there that Lord Shiva, he actually wants to be the servant of Lord Krishna. But Lord Krishna doesn't like to have someone like Lord Shiva to be his servant. And he wouldn't allow Lord Shiva to be his servant. So how does Lord Shiva go about becoming the servant of Lord Krishna? It's very tricky how he does it. What he does is he gets a blessing from Krishna that he can be greater than Krishna. Now, how to be greater than Krishna? Well, Lord Shiva, because he's very dear to Lord Krishna, he was, you know, associating with Lord, he pleased Lord Krishna by so many different services he did. So Lord Krishna is very happy to give him blessing. Yeah, you be greater than me. But when he's greater, who is greater than Krishna? Krishna says, Madbhakta Puji Abdika. He said that great only the, my devotees are greater than me. My servants are one who says he's my devotee, he's not really my devotee. But if he's a devotee of my devotee, then he is my devotee. And so Lord Krishna gave the blessing to Lord Shiva that he could become his servant, that he could become greater than him. So by making Lord Shiva greater than him, then Lord Krishna has to accept him as his servant. This is the, the cunningness of Lord Shiva to get the real mercy of Lord Krishna. He arranges to be the servant of Lord Krishna by making himself greater than Krishna. Who could be greater than Krishna? Only the devotees are greater than Krishna. Krishna says he's always conquered by his devotees. Yate nukampam susamikshama. Oh no, is, is that the verse? The Gane prayasamudapasya namanta eva jivanti san mukaritam bhavadiya bartam stane stita mukim. Sane stita shuti gatantan vanmano beer ye praya so jita jitopi asitai strilokyam. In that verse, that's a famous verse quoted by Lord Chaitanya, quoted by Ramananda Rai when he was asked by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to describe verses from the scripture about the goal of life. So Ramananda Rai, after many different verses, first he spoke about Varnashram, and then he spoke about Karmarpana, offering the results of your work. Then he spoke about Swadharma Tiag, giving up all your duties. And then he spoke about Jnana uh, Mishra Bhakti. And then finally he came to this verse, which Lord Chaitanya accepted as being a very very good description of pure devotion. It says, remain in whatever position you are in and simply hear about Krishna in the association of his devotees. And the Lord Krishna concludes the verse by saying, Jita Jitopi Asita Istrilokyam. He said, in this way, you can conquer the Supreme Lord, although the Lord is unconquerable. The Lord is Ajita, he's unconquerable, but he becomes conquered by the pure love of his devotees. So uh, Krishna is conquered by his devotees. And later on, we will hear also how uh, the Lord tells Prahlad Maharaj that he said, I'm always conquered by you. Because Prahlad Maharaj has so much pure love for the Lord that it conquers the Lord. Right? Krishna is unconquerable, but he's conquered by the pure love of his devotee. Just like we say, Krishna is Madan Mohan. He's the controller of cupids. But there is Madan Mohan Mohini, one who conquers cupid. 
one who conquers the conqueror of Cupid. And that is Srimati Radharani. Her pure devotion conquers Krishna. Krishna is controlled by pure devotion. So Lord Shiva, he has that pure devotion. And this way he's able to conquer Lord Krishna. It's a very interesting point to understand how Lord Shiva is so great that as a pure devotee, he conquers Lord Krishna. So he got the blessing that he would be even greater than Krishna. And you can see also the temples of Lord Shiva are more than the temples of Krishna. Much more, right? We see even you go Navadweep Dam. In the Navadweep Dam, there's so many temples of Lord Shiva. Why are the temples of Lord Shiva more? This is the blessing of Lord Krishna. Lord Shiva took the blessing. Lord Krishna gave the blessing to Lord Shiva that your temples will be more than mine. Because Lord Krishna likes to see his devotees glorified. Lord Krishna, as we, Lord Krishna liked Arjuna to get the credit for the battle of Kurukshetra. He could have done it all himself, but he wants Arjuna to get the credit. And here we see also Lord Krishna giving the credit to Lord Shiva. He likes to see his devotees glorified. But at the same time, he didn't like Lord Shiva to be his servant. So Lord Shiva took advantage of this, that by being greater, in a position greater than Krishna, he can serve Krishna, can give service to Krishna. So in this way, uh, Narada Muni is describing some of the different characteristics of Lord Shiva to help him understand how, just how he's got the greatest mercy from Lord Krishna. However, uh, it, the conversation will go on. This is only Narada Muni presenting his side of it. Lord Shiva will refute these different claims of Narada. But we're going to hear how Narada Muni do, goes on to glorify Mother Parvati. The wife of Lord Shiva, he's also going to glorify her. That she's also a great devotee because she's the consort of Lord Shiva and because Lord Shiva is the greatest Vaishnava. So Parvati is also a very great devotee, great Vaishnava. And we're going, we will hear about this. So Okay, so any questions? Any comments on this? Yes, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, this uh, Lord Shiva has taken the form of a linga uh, to get worshipped. Uh, and uh, that's why, as you said, uh, we find, uh, you know, Shiva temples, uh, he is in the form of a linga, not in his original form. Uh, so, would like to know what is the reason for that, Maharaj? What is the reason for him being in the form of a linga? Well, he has other form. He's not just only in the form of the linga. You see, Lord Shiva... Just like Lord Krishna can expand himself, Ananta Rup, right? Lord Shiva also has many different forms according to his different services, what he's going to do, different services which he performs for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. So Lord Shiva is also involved in the creation, at the beginning of the creation. Lord Shiva is involved in all the different phases of time. So at the beginning of the creation, where Mahavishnu 
all the living entities that, you know, during the devastation, the period of annihilation of the universe, everything entered into Mahavishnu. And then when the creation begins again, then everything comes out from Mahavishnu. As Mahavishnu breathes out, then the creation begins again. So at that time, when Mahavishnu breathes out, the different living entities come out from, the, from Mahavishnu and they're carried by Lord Shiva. So Lord Shiva, he's helping in that work of beginning the creation. By carrying the glance of Lord Shiva, the living entities are impregnated into the material nature. And they're impregnated into the material nature and they will take a body according to their particular karma from their previous past, from the previous uh, existence which they had before the devastation took place. You know, there's, when the devastation takes place, that's like the night time, there's no activity. But before that, they have some karma remaining from their previous birth, and so according to that karma, they will take a particular body. And Lord Shiva, he carries these different living entities so that they impregnate into the material nature. And then the creation begins again. So that is the purpose of that uh, Shiva Linga. Lord Shiva's form is for the purpose of creation. the procreative organ. Just like in the human body, we men, we also have a organ for procreation. So that Shiva Linga, that is for procreation, for carrying the glance of the living entities, that the living entities will take their birth in the material world. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Yes, Prabhu. Describing about Brahma's planet, you were telling that how difficult it is to attain uh, Satya Loka. Like, you got to perform 100 lifetimes of severe austerity, and you got to be prideless to reach uh, the, uh, you know, to be an associate of Brahma. On the other side, we hear Prabhupada promising that if we sincerely practice this very lifetime, we can get back to Godhead. So, how do we reconcile these two uh, statements? Yes, well. We have to understand that going back to Godhead is much more important than going to such a loka. Why do you want, why would we, Prabhupada is not encouraging us. You know, some people, for some people, their goal is elevation to the heavenly planets and to the higher planets. You know, you have people who do yagyas. They have some, you know, there are some Brahmin communities. They do every day the homa. And their goal is to go to higher planets. They want to go up to the heavenly planets. And then from the heavenly planets, they want to go beyond that also to go up to Satya Loka. So, yes, it's the, the scriptures describe that they have to perform their duties perfectly for a hundred lifetimes before they can actually enter into Satya Loka. And they have to be very humble. They have to be very, very pure because you're going to the top of the universe. So in the top of the universe, the forms are more subtle, not so gross. We're on the earthly planet. Our, plan our bodies, you know, we have a lot of water and earth and also in our body. But in the higher planets, as you go up, it, the bodies become more and more subtle. And it means you have to become more and more purified and get rid of all kinds of ego. So to go up there to the higher planet, some people think this is how to get out of the universe, how to get out of birth and death. They think you should go up to Brahma Loka and then wait for the end of Brahma's life. And at the end of Brahma's life, then try to enter into the spiritual world. But actually, you don't have to do that you can go directly back to Godhead from this planet, you see? And some people think you have to be a Brahmana. You have to take birth as a Brahmana. You have to take birth as a Brahmana and then take birth as a Brahmana, then be a perfect Brahmana and 
for a hundred births and then then you can take birth on the planet of Brahma, become an associate of Brahma. We said very difficult to get the position of Lord Brahma. There's only so many vacancies. You may not get a vacancy. So you, you just have to be satisfied to be an associate of Brahma and wait for the end of Brahma's life, at the end of the lifetime of Brahma. Then they can leave. You can get the chance. If you're qualified, you can go into the spiritual world. So it's a lot of endeavor just to go up to the higher planets and wait there so long. And you can see it's a big struggle. Why take so much trouble to get these things? Because even Bhagavad Gita said, Abrahma Bhuvana Loka Punaravartano Arjuna. From the highest planet down to the lowest, all are places of birth and death. Why well, want to go to Brahma Loka if there's also some, if it's also still in the material world? But some people, you know, just like people worship the devas, they worship different demigods to get things which are limited and temporary. Why should they do that? Why should they want to get things which are limited and temporary? If they will simply worship the Supreme Lord, they can get the eternal benefit and they can get the goal of life. Why spend their time worshiping to get things which are so limited and temporary? Because people are less intelligent. That is the problem. People have a small brain, alpa medasha, right? Their brain is small and they cannot understand the waste of time. They cannot see the futility, the useless endeavor in trying to get these material things. They waste so much time and energy, but somehow it means so much to them. And just like we see in this world, we see people labor so much. They go to college, they study so many years, they go on, they do masters, they do PhD, you know, and then after that, they work for a few years and then they retire and it's all finished. It's all useless. You know, people do these things. They, they, they don't seem to think too deeply about the goal of life. When we tell them the goal of life is to get out of birth and death, then they think, Oh, you know, I'd, I'd rather try to get my PhD, you know, I'm or I'm doing my MBA, you know, and like this, you know. But it's also temporary. You know, you go and study all these things, and then later on you get cancer and you're going to die, you know. So what was the good of it? You know, you spent so much time and money and then you're going to die anyway. Yeah? And it's just but this is somehow this is the stupidity of our race the human beings and they were not so intelligent of course even in the higher planets the higher planets the people in the higher planets they're supposed to be more intelligent but they're more intelligent in the material sense that they are also attracted to sense gratification and they're also troubled by competition and jealousy and all of these different things, all these evil attributes are also there. They're also visible among the demigods. So we shouldn't be bewildered by these things. Rather, we should be fixed on what is the real goal, the real purpose of life, which Srila Prabhupada was always enforcing on us and preaching to us very strongly that the goal of life is to get out of this wheel of birth and death, right? We have the book Coming Back, and the last chapter is called Don't Come Back. If you come back, it means you failed, you know? Just like if you're studying at college and you, you fail, you have to repeat. You have to, you have to do everything again pay all the fees and everything. It's so much trouble. It's so boring. You have to go through the same classes again. And then again comes the exam and you may fail again, you know? So 
that's what happens when you fail. So we don't want to be troubled with this kind of failure. We want to be sure to get out of this material world. Now, how to get out? Well, just try to understand the birth and activities of Lord Krishna. Just try to understand a little devotion, how much mercy, how much benefit we get by a drop of devotion. And so if we take to Krishna consciousness seriously and endeavor, put all our time and energy into trying to serve Krishna, to do some service for Krishna, then this will be actually pleasing to Krishna. Just like Lord Shiva, he's always preaching. He's, he's, he doesn't identify with the material world at all. He's going naked and he's wearing this garland with the poison herbs around his neck and skulls as well around his neck and then snakes on his body and his body's all covered in ashes. He doesn't identify with the material world, but he's always Krishna conscious. He's always fully absorbed in thought of the Lord and serving the Lord, chanting the names of the Supreme Lord. And he told his wife also, chant the name of Lord Ram. Ramen, Ramen, Namo, Rame, Sahasra, Nama, Bistu, Yam, Sri, Drama, Nama, Varanini. Right? He told his wife, don't chant even the 1,000 names of Vishnu. Just chant the name of Ram. One name of Ram is equal to 1,000 names of Vishnu. So we chant the holy name of Lord Rama. And then, of course, we learn that three names of Rama is equal to one name of Krishna. So we should chant Krishna's name over everything. Get the supreme mercy. Okay. All right. Hare Krishna. Srimad. We had Bhagavatam Rita Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Gaur Premanande.